again, I really recommend him as a, uh, an author. He's written um, Renovation of the Heart. Uh, he's written The Spirit of the Disciplines. Um, they've greatly sort of informed and, and, and inspired me uh, in the preparation of this sermon series and, and, and just generally in life. I really recommend any of Dallas Willard's work. He, he talks about um, spiritual disciplines, these practices, as learning effective cooperation with the divine order. Learning effective cooperation with the divine order. We deliberately put ourselves in the slipstream of God in order to live his life, his way, fruitfully, effectively. And we do that through practice. It creates the ability to do what needs doing, spiritual practices, create the ability to do what needs doing when they need doing so that these disciplines, these practices become instinctive. Second nature, we might say. Subconscious. We don't even think about it. We find we are living the life of Christ. But it doesn't come naturally to start with. We have to work at it. Think of it. How many, just to help me here, how many um, can drive a car? You, 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 so most of you, that experience, great, thank you. So, you know, when you first started to, to drive a car, you couldn't think about anything else. That whole coordinating the sort of clutch and the gear and the accelerator and the kangaroo starts and all that kind of stuff. You know, and, and when you're first out on the road and there's traffic around and the people and pedestrians and lights and... Oh, and that, that, do you remember that sort of fear of going out on the road? Do you remember the first time you drove a car on your own when, once you passed? No, no comforting presence on your left-hand side. Ooh, you're focusing hard. Have you got the radio on blaring out? I doubt it. You just, I want to get home in one piece. <laughs> but after a while, the kind of bite on the clutch and the change in the gear and how the engine is, yeah, so I might, I might put the radio on. I might even have a conversation. Hey, let's go for a drive. <laughs> because, because what was first sort of consumed us, gripped our minds as we had to really focus over practice, practice, practice become second nature we can instinctively drive and that's the point of the spiritual disciplines we practice 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 not so that we become good at practicing I don't practice driving to become good at practicing driving I become I, I practice driving to be good at driving itself not at the practice of it I don't I don't practice my golf swing so that I'm really good at practicing my golf swing I practice my golf swing so that I can play better golf and the spiritual disciplines, let's not get fixated on them. The goal is Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. It isn't that I'm really good at reading my Bible. I'm getting much better at prayer. I'm so good at fasting. I find solitude and silence are my best friend. <laughs> we don't focus on the practices. The practices enable us to focus more on Jesus. And he lives in us and through us and out of us. Practices are good things. Embrace, practice, seek the opportunity to practice, to train. Train yourself to be godly. Be diligent in these things. Give yourself wholly to them, Paul says to Timothy. So the first myth, first myth that the, this is somehow sort of negative or, or for the keenies or... No, it's for all of us. This is how we get better. This is how we get good. This is how we get God. Second myth, and I touched on this a few weeks ago, um, so I won't dwell on it, but it's, it's just this idea around grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, that little acronym, God's life, the, the, the new life that we have through forgiveness of sins, uh, the spirit in us, all, all of that from God. This is a gift of God, Paul says, not that you've earned it in any way. And I think sometimes this idea of training and of you know, working hard at our, our Christian life, at these different disciplines, it conjures up in our mind sort of um, working and, and kind of effort. And we think, well, hang on, that, isn't that counter to the gospel? I thought, I thought the gospel was all about what God has done for us and we simply receive what he's done. Yes. But here's the little confusion. The opposite of grace is earning, not effort. The opposite of grace is earning, not effort. I cannot get to God by my own merit, out of my own goodness, out of trying to pull up my socks and trying a little harder, being a little better. I will never be good enough for God in my own attempts. In my, I'll never earn my way, merit my way to God. 
There's nothing I can do to satisfy the fact that my sinful life cuts me off from him. He has paved the way through Jesus Christ. That's grace, forgiveness. But having received the gift of grace, I can then make, I'm instructed to make every effort to work that grace out in my life. The opposite of grace is earning, not effort. That's why Paul says here, train, be diligent, strive, give yourself wholly. This is flat out commitment on your part. Remember Willard, effective cooperation. We, we work with God to slide into the slipstream of, of the divine order for our lives. Final little myth, actually, I, I said there were two. There's one, just, it's, a, it's a kind of heresy, but I think it still impacts the church today. It was a sort of second or third century heresy, I think, but it, it still lurks around. It's the heresy of docetism. Uh, docetism from the Latin word doceo, to seem or appear. And, and I think how it arose was, was this, that people looked at the life of this guy, Jesus, I said, you know what, we've, we have tried to live like him. We've tried for our lives to match his life. And you know what, we always fall short. And you know what, let's think about it. the son of God. Of course he's different. Of course he's, he's not like us. He, you know what, the, the heresy goes, he didn't really live. He just appeared amongst us. He wasn't real. He wasn't human. He didn't go through all the stuff we have to go through. No wonder we can't be like him. We're not like him. He's different from us. He just appeared to be like us, but he wasn't really like us. Now, I'm not saying you consciously think that, but I wonder whether subconsciously we sort of, we kind of park Jesus in a slightly different category. It was so long ago. It was so far away. And he's God's son. It's different. Therefore, I'll never be like him. Therefore, what's the point in trying? Let's settle for something other. And docetism, that's that's what undermines Christian faith and particularly undermines spiritual fitness. It's this idea that I'll never be like Jesus. Now, I want to be realistic. We live in a fallen world. We live in flesh and blood and sin and temptation is still prevalent. We will stumble and fall from time to time. Every person who sets out on a fitness regime or uh, sort of seeks to you know, practice the piano or to become good in whatever it is, they'll have good times and bad times. There'll be plateau moments and so on. Yes. But the hope of the gospel is that we can morph. The hope of the gospel is that Christ can change us from the inside out. We can be transformed bit by bit through diligent use of spiritual discipline, of practice. Final thing, the the, the principle, the working principle. And it's this. And Willard, Dallas Willard brings this out and uh, Altberg has picked up on this as well and I found this such a helpful releasing principle. How do I allow the life of God to be released in me? How do I live a sustainable, spiritually fit life? And the answer is through training, not trying. Training, not trying. What do I mean? If you said to me tomorrow, or you said to me today, rather, that tomorrow I'm, I've been entered into a marathon, 26.2 miles, and I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow. I promise you, I, I'm, not, I'm not the least fit person in the whole wide world, but I simply could not run 26.2 consecutive miles without stopping. I'd be walking most of the way. I, it doesn't matter how hard I try, I wouldn't be able to do it tomorrow. But if you said to me that in six months' time you've entered me into a marathon and you gave me between now and six months to train, then I'm, I'm almost as confident that I could if I set my mind to it, reordered my life, reprioritized some of the, things I, the ways I use my time and so on. If I began to think about how I, what, what I eat and how else I train, if I begin to put into place all sorts of practices and training, in six months' time, I could run a marathon if I train to. Doesn't matter how much I try, it's about training. I'm not particularly musical, but if you sat me down in front of that piano and you said, look, you've got a year, because I think I'd need longer, to play a piece of Mozart, 
or Beethoven or whatever, you know, some kind of concerto. Uh, if, I, if, I, if you gave me that and said, I would like to do that tomorrow, it doesn't matter how hard I try, I, I don't even know where middle C is. But that's where I'd start. Someone show me middle C. Okay, ding. And we start from there. I do some scales, I do some chords. I do bit by bit, day by day. I build it up and build it up. I train, 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 practice, practice, practice. In a year's time, I'd have a jolly good bash at Beethoven's fifth or whatever it might be. If I train, I can do it. Just trying won't get me anywhere, save frustration. The principle to transforming one's life through the work of the Spirit living in us. The principle is through training, not trying. And here's the, sort of the, the, the appendix to that principle. It's through indirect effort. Through indirect effort. What I mean is this. I, I think they say with the marathon, you don't, you don't train to run a marathon by running a marathon. I think they, they actually advise, don't do that. It's not very good for our body. So you, you do it through indirect effort effort, indirect training, you do a, a, a five mile run and a ten mile run, you build it up, you do other runs, you do other kinds of fitness. You do it through indirect effort. And through indirect effort, you attain your goal through training. Final illustration, fun if you like, but it's from the, the original Karate Kid film, probably before most of you were born, I think it's mid 80s. Um, Brought out, but uh, do you remember the, the original? I think there's a later one come out, um, uh, sort of 2010 or so. But this is the story of Daniel, and he dreams of becoming a karate champion. He just wants to be the best karate person there is. And so he travels to this, uh, the film is based on the story. He goes to this uh, karate expert there on the left, Mr. Miyagi. And Mr. Miyagi is a wise sage, he's a, he's a kind of guru in all things karate. And Daniel sort of says, okay, teach me how to be an amazing uh, karate expert. And um, Mr. Mikey, he knows this principle of training someone through indirect effort. He knows that if he just sets in the goal of becoming the best karate, it, it, won't, it, it kind of won't happen. But it will happen if he trains through indirect effort. And so what he says to Daniel is, okay, I will make you a karate champion. But first, I'd like you to paint my fence. Do you, do those of you remember this have seen the film? And so he gives this, uh, you, you see uh, Mr. Maggie, he gives him a pot of paint and a brush, and he shows him, he's very, very careful, meticulous. You paint the fence, like, hold the brush like this, and it's like a picket fence. And he says, you paint the fence, paint the fence, paint the fence. And, he, and you, say, you think, oh, Daniel thinks, okay, I was sort of, you know, quid pro quo, I'll do a favour for you, and you'll make me a karate champ. So he paints the fence, and the camera pans away, and it's not just a little garden fence, it's a massive, great perimeter, it goes on for miles. And day after day, Daniel, paint the fence, paint the fence, paint the fence. And he finishes the job, he goes to Mr. Miyagi, he says, I've painted your fence now, make me a karate champion. And Mr. Miyagi goes, I'll make you a karate champion, but first I want you to sand my floor. And there's a kind of wooden parquet floor like this, and he gives him a, a block of sandpaper with a sort of handle, and he shows him to get on his hands and knees, and he's got to sand the floor, sand the floor, sand the floor. And again, the camera pans away, you think it's just a little sort of hallway, it's a massive room. And for hours and hours, Daniel, sand the floor, sand the floor, sand the floor. And he comes back weary, he says, I've sanded your floor. Now, teach me to be a karate champion. And Mr. Miyagi, he knows there's still some training to do by indirect effort. And he says, I will make you a karate champion. But first of all, I want you to clean my cars. And he's got this sort of fleet of cars. And he gives him one polish and uh, one um, cloth. And with that cloth, you, you put the wax on. And with this other cloth, you take the wax off. Wax on, wax off. <laughs> wax on. Wa it's not just one or two cars, it's a whole car park of cars. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Daniel is getting really annoyed. Because he wants to be a karate champion. But all he's been doing is painting the fence and sanding the floor. And wax on, wax off. He finally finishes the job, and through gritted teeth, he goes to Mr. Miyagi, and he's really annoyed. He says, you are going to make me a karate champion. You haven't done anything of the sort. All I've done is slave labor for you. I've just painted your fence, and I've sanded the floor, and I've waxed on, and I've waxed off. And Mr. Miyagi knows that the time has come. And he's going to demonstrate to Daniel that through indirect effort, he has actually trained him to become a karate champion. And without announcing anything, he turns to strike Daniel. 
And Daniel, instinctively, without even thinking what he's doing, he goes, paint the fence, wet the floor, stand off, what that? And he throws off this karate champion. He rebuffs him without even thinking about it. And in that moment, he realizes that he has become the karate expert through indirect effort. Paint the fence, sand the floor, wax off, wax on, whatever it is. <laughs> and that's the principle of spiritual disciplines. That's why when we look at things, uh, there'll be some disciplines of withdrawal from the life that conforms us to its pattern. And we will discipline ourselves to withdraw and practice what it is just to, to take a step back. But there are other disciplines of engagement. So we'll look at the, the, the discipline of celebration that inculcates joy, that just goes a little bit deeper than fun, which our culture knows all about. Joy, celebration, tapping into the life of God of solitude and stillness in a busy world, of silence in a chatty world. And we'll exercise, we'll practice servanthood in a world that looks after number one. We'll practice these contraflow disciplines that will grow the life of God in us through indirect effort. We'll train rather than try. And as we train, we'll become spiritually fit. You up for the challenge? <laughs> Let's stand together.